Today, on the Ident Identify Yourself livestream, the relationship between gender and sexuality, and why ang angry gay men just need to calm down and work together with the rest of the LGBT community. Well, hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Herrick, an author and podcaster. There are links below here on the stream that you can check for more information about me and the work that I do. My personal website's the first link there, that's amethysta.io. You will find the social media networks I'm on, and uh, please follow me on those social media networks so that you can get updates on everything I do. My professional website is the second link down, that's genderidentitytoday.com. All of my articles and my podcasts are published there, as well as work from other contributors. So if you like this content, please consider subscribing at genderidentitytoday.com. You can get a subscription for as low as two bucks a month, which is not bad. And if you'd like to contribute content to Gender Identity Today, you can contact me through my personal website contact, contact page, and uh, we'll get, some, uh, get a relationship going. And finally, the last link there if you'd like to leave a tip. That last link goes to coffee.com and you can send a tip as you see fit. So the topic today comes from several comments that I've gotten from gay men. It's very interesting because they, they very commonly they say you have appropriated our message of peace and love. And, and it was this message of peace and love that resulted in the Marriage Equality Act, which, as, as you may know, there was a Supreme Court decision that says that gay marriage needs to be legal in every state. And so by appropriating this message of peace and love and bringing gender nonconformance into the argument, this is what gay men say, is that it, it adds unnecessary baggage to LGBTQ activism. Because they say, or I've been told, it is about sexuality. It has to do with whom you love. And me coming and talking about gender dilutes their arguments and weakens their cause. Now, if you've watched any of my videos in, say, the last, you know, week, you'll see that I disagree. I believe that both gender and sexuality are part of identity. Now, they are not the same, but certainly gender and sexuality are related and they're related in that the process of discovering them is the same. So I started off by saying they're part of identity. Let me talk at least quickly about what I mean when I say identity. One of the things that we do, particularly in the political realm these days, is treat identity and gender and sexuality as possessions. That like we have an identity, we have a gender, we have a sexuality. And there's a good reason for that. It's kind of an important foundational tenet of the born this way argument, because if any of these is mutable, we should be able to choose against them. I'm going to make an aside here to talk about conservative rhetoric, because the conservative rhetoric faces a dichotomy regarding born this way, because we get told being homosexual or being transgender is a choice. We are not born that way, and that's why conservative rhetoric tends to think about conversion therapy. They figure if they just beat you long enough, you will choose against how you are not born. Now, an interesting dichotomy here is that being heterosexual or cisgender is not a choice. They say that is our, our natural state. It is derived from genetics or genitalia, or brain structure, or whatever it is they come up with. In other words, we are to born this way. We just need to be born the way they want us to be born. Now, unfortunately, identity is not static. Identity is a process. And identity has two major parts. The first, as I've, as I've talked about in other uh, live streams, and I have a link to the articles that I discuss, um, in the notes here, the first part is the origin of identity. And the origin of identity is an immutable core set of beliefs and motivations and desires. The important thing about the origin of identity is that only we are capable of determining the contents because it's internal, it's personal. But this is how we are actually born this way because we have an immutable core set of beliefs. 
The other part of my theory of identity is a social environment. Each of us has to live within this social environment. So while we have an origin of identity, we express it in between people and social norms and social expectations. And so what that does is set up what I've called a process of mediation. As we attempt to express who we are, we also have to attempt to maximize our safety within the social environment. And so we end up making this back and forth decision. Do we express ourselves completely or do we maintain safety in the social environment? And sometimes they overlap. If they do, great. If they don't, that's where we face this negotiation. And at the very least, with the transgender experience, if you've listened to conservative rhetoric at all, you will see that there's not a tremendous amount of safety, <laughs> at least in the political realm. So one thing that I did not describe is the effect of experience on identity. I've said only you have this immutable core set of beliefs that get expressed within a social environment. But as we negotiate safety within our environment, we also acquire data. We find out how the social environment reacts to us as we attempt to express ourselves. We also learn about any repercussions that may occur, and we learn about any reinforcement that may occur. And re repercussions and reinforcements are important. This is the way a social environment actually perpetuates itself. If you attempt to express yourself and you do it in a way that the social environment thinks is okay, you get reinforcement. Um, and if you do it in a way that the social environment does not like, you will end up with repercussions, some of which may be severe. The other part of data that we get is how we feel about the expression. Because just because you look inside yourself and you find, I want to try something, it doesn't necessarily imply we're going to love it. Going to make one more aside. Conservative rhetoric. It claims that the paths are one way. If you listen to the rhetoric today, they say that gender-affirming care is all or nothing. If you start it, you're falling into this dark pit that you can't escape. And if you come out of the pit, then that means that gender-affirming care must be ineffective. So to conservative rhetoric, there is no explore, exploration around gender or sexuality. And that's because even though we're not born that way, we're born that way as, as, as it works. So as we're acquiring this data through experience, what we really do is add nuance to our origin of identity. While we cannot change our core beliefs, we can very clearly choose against our core beliefs, at least temporarily. And from a transgender perspective, choosing against those core beliefs means living as the gender that so the social environment expects of you, as opposed to transitioning and possibly feeling better. But this data represents a refinement of the core beliefs with the input from the social environment and your own experience. And this is how we determine things like our tastes, our likes, our dislikes. To use my canonical example, you're not going to know what your favorite vegetable is unless you try many vegetables. And you also, likewise, cannot know the level of safety you're going to experience in an environment without actually testing it. And this is how children end up learning social expectations, is by trying something and, and either being slapped down by the social environment or applauded. So that is experience. When I talk about experiences in this data, though, we have experiences that can be neither qualified nor quantified. It's knowledge that we have. It's things we know, but we can only explain it with, because I do. These are things like, my favorite vegetable is broccoli. Looking at flowers is relaxing. Purple hair is atrocious. Androgyn androgynous people are sexy. These are, it's knowledge that maybe we have, but we don't know why we know it. That's part of the origin of identity interacting with a social environment. What we've done is learn about the world around us. And what that does is help us figure out the aspects of reality that appeal to us. Now, I use a blanket term 
for likes and dislikes. This is figuring out those aspects of reality. The blanket term that I use is just beauty, which admittedly is somewhat of a bland term, but it is also the focus of the branch of philosophy called aesthetics. And so I use it because at the very least it's a familiar term. But our sense of beauty is a system of experience. This is the nuance that we add to our origin of identity. And this system holds things like what we like, what we dislike, what we believe, whom we love, whom we hate, against whom we are prejudiced. That's our system of beauty, sense of beauty, that system of experience. It's important to point out this is almost never consistent. There will be people you meet that you go, well, I like this person, but you don't like somebody who's similar. So it's not necessarily consistent and probably never will be. But that's okay, because that's our system of experience expressed as a sense of beauty. Now, you're probably wondering, hey, Amy, didn't you say you were going to talk about gender and sexuality? Absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about the difference between an incoming experience and an outgoing expression. Let's start with the outgoing expression. When I was growing up, I saw beauty in the world, and I looked at things and there were, there were aspects of it that I liked. For instance, I love eyes and I love hair. Those are the things that are important to me in terms of beauty. Our outgoing expression is what we want to express ourselves. Now, it's important to point out these may be safe expressions. They may be dangerous expressions. Depends upon the social environment. And this is where the negotiation can occur. What this represents is a personal identity, because this is the process, of dis the process of discovery that I have called gender as a mediator. And on a day-to-day -day basis, the snapshot at the time you're going to express something is what we, we call gender identity. And this is an entire complex. I've spoken about this before, but this is an entire complex of physical, cognitive, and behavioral characteristics and expression that's within the social environment. So that's the outgoing expression. The outgoing expression of our sense of beauty is gender. The incoming experience. Once again, we go and we look out into the world and we find what we like. For me, I ended up finding beauty both in men and women. This is not necessarily what we want to express, but what we want to experience, what we want to experience through somebody else. Just like um, the outgoing expression within our social environment, it may be safe and it may be dangerous, but for the most part, we're not looking at a negotiation with a social environment. These are things that we like because we do. That's just about it. As opposed to being a personal identity that we express, this is more of a social identity that we experience through the social environment. This process of discovery is not a mediation. It's a discovery. What do I find attractive in men? What do I find attractive in women? And the snapshot at the time that we experience is our sexuality. This is wanting to experience another person's Physical, cog physical, cognitive, and behavioral expression within the social environment. All right, I'm finally going to get to this relationship between gender and sexuality. Identity means experiencing the world and the social environment through the lens of our immutable origin of identity. Our gender is an outgoing expression of our sense of beauty. Our sexuality is an incoming experience of our sense of beauty. So what that means is we attempt to attract people we want to experience by expressing our gender identity. And we attempt to experience people who express our preferred gender identity. They're related. They're almost cyclical. We express a gender identity and experience another person's gender identity. And this relationship comes through the immutable origin of identity. This is still the mechanism of born this way. It is the foundation of who we are. And it's the reason, ultimately, 
that humans require inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which ultimately are the basis of marriage equality and the basis of protecting gender-affirming care, because we must protect the ability for each of us to discover and manifest our identities. So I'm going to sum up by saying I'm not appropriating or perverting a message of peace and love. What I'm doing is clarifying and generalizing this message of peace and love. What I've done is applied it to all senses of beauty, not just incoming, but outgoing. And this, goddammit, is why the LGBTQ community needs to stick together, because we're all targets, because our sense of beauty conflicts with social norms. We have no choice but to battle the idea that these social norms, in terms of appearance, in terms of behavior, in terms of the person to whom we are attracted, we need to battle the idea that these social norms should be legislated. And that's the point. So, if you're a gay man out there, hopefully you've listened to this and you've gone, okay, I got it. There is a relationship between gender and sexuality Amethyst is not coming after me, and she's not killing off my marriage equality. Nope, I'm not killing it off. It's other people, including uh, the Supreme Court, if uh, you heard anything about the some of the opinions coming down recently. And that's that. So we've reached the end of this uh, episode of Identify Yourself. Just a reminder, I am leaving for Thailand on July 5th, 2024. So as of the moment of recording... That's next Friday. Apparently Friday is that direction. So this live stream is going to be on hiatus after we stop here until I'm back in August. Not a big deal, but I've decided I'm actually going to sit in Thailand and rest. Crazy concept. I know it. The other thing is that this is the last weekend of Pride Month. Here we go. I'm wearing my, my Elvira shirt and my Elvira top here as a celebration. So I hope each of you has had a very happy Pride Month. I know that mine has been interesting, mostly because I've been struggling with hormonal issues. But I mentioned in order to close out the Pied for Pride 2024, because you can't get away from this, I will get pies from all colors of the Pride flag. And my wife has been working tirelessly for at least the past hour making these pies. So... I'm going to go on break. Shouldn't take more than about five minutes. And uh, I'll be outside getting ready to get covered in pride flag. <laughs> so, all right, stand by. No more than five minutes. I know what it is. We on? All right. All right, here we go. This is going to be Pride for Pride 2024. Closing it out. So, happy Pride Month, everybody. I'll say that after every pie. What the hell? Oh, all right, go ahead. <laughs> all right, well, happy pie for happy pride month there. All right, orange, orange, go ahead. All right. Orange, which has to do with somebody. I don't know who. All right. Be kind. <laughs> it's stuck to our face. Okay, that was great. Oh, we're halfway there. Yeah, only halfway there. I promise you. Okay. Well, <laughs> give me a second to recover. All right, well, pride, go. That one can't be too hard because it doesn't have very much. <laughs> Oh gosh. Yeah, then you're ready. All right, go ahead. Oh, yeah, just no, we'll just finish. <laughs> oh, that was good smackage. Did you see that? That just hit the fence. Oh, Dang, that was liquid. All righty, kitten. All right. Purple pie. On our purple hair. Happy Pride. Happy Pride Month. All right, go ahead. Pied for Pride, 2024. I cannot hear out of an ear here. Ugh. All right. Happy Pride Month. 
subscribe.